So it's uh, great to be with you here tonight and I really appreciate you coming out um, to be a part of this gathering as we explore what does it mean to listen and learn uh, from what God is doing in the global church today. I mean, my passion is really just to curate or facilitate conversations around mission and theology, around evangelism and church life, uh, around a whole variety of areas that are taking new life and dynamism globally today. You know, the church is expanding exponentially in the world today. It's easy for us in the West to lose sight of that, uh, to feel like we've got to batten down the hatches, to feel like we're under threat, uh, to become introverted and defensive. But actually what God is doing today is exponential. It's thrilling. Uh, we should be excited about it. And we need to be engaged in what God is doing globally and in global conversations. Where all this started for me was... It was hard to know where something starts, isn't it? But a number of years ago, I was speaking at a major conference in the Philippines, and there were thousands of delegates from across Asia, and I stayed in a backpacker's hostel, and the first morning I was woken up with the sound of sobbing. And I looked down and I saw a old, I discovered later, Vietnamese pastor kneeling beside his bed, weeping and praying for the church in Vietnam and of Asia. And I got to know this man, and over a period of about 30 years, that church had grown from about a dozen people in his home to tens of thousands of people spread across the country. The stories he told were like stories of the early church, stories of growth, of proclamation, of persecution, of suffering, of him losing his brothers to, to um, the authorities, them being whisked away in the night. But then what really struck me was when I would go to the conference to speak, everyone at the conference looked like me, white, middle-aged, male. And it began to really disturb me that there were so many stories like his story that were not being told. And I remember going home and saying to my wife, we need to find a way to tell these stories. I mean, too often people who look like me, who sound like me, who have the similar background in education, get all of the platform, and yet there are so many voices that are not heard or are effectively silenced. So how do we go about providing a space for that? And that began a bit of a journey for me. It led to a number of different things. Firstly, a series that I'm writing on, um, the, what it means for the church to be missional today. Volume one explores how do we engage with Western voices, Volume two will be voices from the two thirds or majority world. And volume three will be indigenous Aboriginal First Nation voices. And then I published this book, Global Church, engaging with about 150 thinkers from Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, the Caribbean, and so on. First Nation, indigenous context, asking what can we learn? What can we discover about faith and mission and vitality from what God is doing globally today. Well, when I published this book, I got another contract. And I was about to write it and my kids said to me, Dad, you guys need to kind of, you academics love your big books that nobody reads. Um, you know, teenagers can be brutal. But, but maybe what you should do is actually get on the road and film. Anyway, I tossed that around. I won't give you the whole story, but uh, theologians don't usually like to be too creative. But under the, the power of the Holy Spirit and the constant badgering of my children, um, I decided to get on the road. I had six months study leave and I got on the road for six months and traveled around the globe interviewing Christian leaders. I did 100 interviews at that stage. Now I've done about 300 Africans, Asians, Latin Americans, middle, across the Middle East, um, right across the world, particularly focusing on uh, voices that are not often heard asking them to tell their story so that we can listen to that story. My passion is a global conversation. So because sometimes people say to me, but Graham, you sound like you're saying the West has to learn from everywhere else, but they've got nothing to learn from us anymore. And all I'm really saying is actually that sometimes it's time to stop listening to the voices that are always heard and listen to the voices that have been underrepresented or silenced or not listened to enough. Secondly, what I'm saying is that I'm thinking about and I'm trying to achieve a global conversation where we learn from each other, where Australians are learning from Kiwis, 
where Kiwis are learning from Africans and Africans are learning from Asians. Asians are learning from the Church of Palestine. And there's a global conversation that starts up and uh, we can truly enrich each other. I hope that that is beginning to happen globally and hopefully this, what I'm doing is just a little part of that. Let's talk about the growth of the church globally um, today. I, it probably hasn't skipped your attention that the church is growing exponentially, breathtakingly, globally today. And some of the statistics might illustrate this. Christianity in Africa in 1900 was 10 million, about 10 million people. By 2050, it will be about 1.1 billion believers in Africa. In 1900, in Asia, there were 22 million believers. Uh, by 2050, there will be 600 million. I mean, if, you, if I was to sort of harness the statistics, they would look something like this. Christianity in North America and Europe and European-derived civilizations about doubled between 1900 and 2010. So from about 460 million to about 900 and something million, about doubled. Whereas Christianity in the majority world, in the global south and in the you know, two-thirds world, um, grew by 1,400% in the same period of time. In fact, by 2050, the church will have grown, uh, the church in the majority world will have grown for, by 2,500% between 1900 and 2050. Um, the numbers are actually staggering and should give us pause. And it's not that the church is, is in decline globally today, it's that the center of gravity of Christianity has, has inexorably shifted. And yet the church in the Western world has had trouble keeping up with that or coming to terms with what that really means for us today. Philip Jenkins concludes, we're currently living through one of the most transforming moments in the history of religion worldwide. Over the last five centuries, the story of Christianity has been in, um, inextricably bound with that of Europe and European-derived civilizations, above all North America. Until recently, the overwhelming majority of Christians have lived in white nations. Over the last century, however, the center of gravity of the Christian world has shifted away from Europe southward to Africa and Latin America and eastward towards Asia. Today, the largest Christian communities on the face of the planet are in those continents today. Take China, for instance. By 2030, maybe at worst by 2050, there'll be more Christians in China than in, than in the United States. And in fact, if Christianity continues to grow at its current pace in China, before long, there'll be more Christians in China than in all of the US and in Canada combined. You may know, for instance, that there are more Christians in Indonesia than the whole population of Australia. Now, it's true that Indonesia is a very populous country, and so you've got to look at this, the, the, this, what is that relative number compared with the entire population. But we sometimes forget the extent of the growth of Christianity, even in contexts like Indonesia. What does it mean for us to understand that afresh? And the three groups that I'm particularly interested in us listening to are the majority world church. Now, I don't use third world because I think that it's sort of pejorative. I don't use developing world because I don't think that makes any sense when large parts of Latin America and Asia and even parts of Africa actually are far more developed than the West. I don't like... Um, so the only term that really, the global south doesn't make sense either, when we're in the south, aren't we? Um, I, um, I think majority world makes most sense. The majority of the world's population today are in these contexts, and the majority of the church is in these contexts. These shifts that are going on will not change, and the church has got to pay attention to them. So I'm concerned with, largely, the majority world church, the church in diaspora, uh, the immigrant church, some would call it the immigrant church, but I'm an immigrant to Australia myself. The church of the diaspora uh, and the church of First Nations, Aboriginal, Maori, Indigenous 
uh, populations and what God is doing amongst those groups. And I'm particularly interested in these three groups because these are the groups where God is doing something extraordinary, but we're not paying enough attention to them. Take the Church of the Diaspora, for instance. Baptists in New South Wales and the ACT, where I come from, New, uh, New South Wales and Australian Capital Territory, we like to talk about the fact that we're growing. But what we don't tell you is that we're growing by acquisition. Um, that actually most of the growth of the Baptist churches where I come from is happening amongst the diaspora church, uh, amongst Asian, uh, Middle Eastern, African and other communities that affiliate with us eventually. And in fact, as I travelled around the, uh, North America, for instance, and parts of Europe, the same story is told. Some of the most exciting works in mission and faith today are happening amongst the diaspora, amongst immigrant communities. Um, some call them ethnic communities, but, but um, I've got an ethnicity too, so I don't think ethnic churches quite works, does it? So let me, let me um, show you um, a video just as an introduction to the project. As they are and to my comfort if I you know if my things are okay and I got what I need um, having somebody start knocking on the door of my country or my mm. church or my house is threatening and, and, and that's when they only understood their own worldview basically Christology meaning who Christ is with the work of Christ Jesus and the Spirit baptized in Acts 2 the one who pours out of the Spirit upon, upon all flesh Graham Hill's Global Church Project invites often unheard voices from around the world to enter into a powerful conversation about the shape of integral mission in the 21st century. It's an invaluable resource for deepening and broadening our understanding of the very future of the church. I don't know of any other source that provides as comprehensive a picture of the Global Church in Mission as the Global Church Project. And in a sense, taking it even a step further into the reconciled existence. In the same way that we talk about the spirit dwelling. We should understand it's actually it's a neutral value. The sheer range of gifting, the sheer range of potential, the church is propelled forward by that. The diversity of voices represented here demonstrates the complexity and yet unity of the body of Christ around the world. And uh, what we're doing is developing a global team who are translating all of the website into multiple languages because it can't stay in English anymore. Um, I've given you some statistics and I want to start to talk about some takeaways. What do we learn? Over the next 15 minutes I just want us to explore that for a moment. I'm not suggesting that everything that is happening outside of the West can be easily transferred uh, into Western contexts. I'm not suggesting that we should do that uncritically. Um, and when I teach a postgraduate unit on this, we explore, for instance, what do global local conversations look like? What are some of the dangers? What kind of posture do we need to embrace in order to do that well? And how do we contextualize things that are happening in other parts of the world or even other parts of our city to our own particular context? So there's a lot that we need to explore about that. And I don't want to give you the impression that Everything that's happening elsewhere can be directly or immediately applied in our own context. 
But certainly what we do need to do is we need to ask, what are some of the themes that are emerging? How do we engage with those themes in a creative, critical way? And then how do we contextualise them and apply them into our own context with some courage and discernment, humility and prayer? So let's have a look at some of the themes that are emerging um, over the next uh, 15 minutes and then I'll talk about some of the applications further. The first thing that strikes me is that growing churches emphasise mission and evangelism. There is no mission without the church and there is no church without mission and it's time for us in the West, I think, to fully appreciate what it means to be missional churches. Now, as I travel around the globe, one thing that really strikes me is the passion and the enthusiasm for mission today. I spent some time with um, some friends in Korea, for instance, at a prayer meeting. I went along to that prayer meeting I was asked to speak at, and I turned up and there were thousands of people at the prayer meeting. It wasn't the kind of prayer meeting that I'm used to. But during that prayer meeting, people would get up and tell stories of their mission into other parts of Asia. Now I've got to admit to you that, you know when you travel globally and you listen to other cultures, you discover your own unexamined prejudices and bias. I've got to be honest with you that I had some prejudice about Korean mission. Uh, I was a bit suspicious that they were too readily repeating some of the problems of Western mission. So I went with some suspicions, but then actually sitting in that prayer meeting, listening to the passion for mission, listening to people unpack the ways in which they'd given up so much, sacrificed so much, taken so many risks. I thought I was listening to stories like those that would be recounted in the book of Acts. And it reminded me that wherever the church is growing globally, people are passionate about mission and mobilize, being mobilized for mission today. The second lesson where I think we discover is that renewed churches emphasize the Holy Spirit and renewal. See, in the West, we've tried to pull apart too much, I think, programs and proclamation from moving in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to do a missional pneumatology and a pneumatological mission? What does it mean to do mission in the power and the presence and the vitality of the Holy Spirit but also to press into the work of the Holy Spirit in a way that empowers us and emboldens us and enthuses us for mission. Julian Wansuk Mara in their research in Asia suggests, for instance, that wherever the church grows organically, it's almost always renewalist. It's almost always dependent on the power and presence of the Spirit. And I think in the West, and I'm speaking now as an evangelical reformed evangelical, we're too suspicious about the power and presence of the Spirit and we need to rediscover, uh, rediscover this in fresh ways. There are negatives that we need to be aware of where there's often renewalism going on. There can be things like the prosperity gospel and so forth, but there's also life and vitality, boldness for witness, dependence on the power of the Spirit is not something that we should be afraid of. Um, it was once said that what the West calls Pentecostalism, the rest of the world calls Christianity. <laughs> and we've got to be very cautious, I think, before we're too readily suspicious of the work of the Spirit. Spiritual churches emphasize prayer and community. What would it mean for us to live in the power of prayer the way that we once did? Now, if you look at the history of Christian movements and revivals, they're always birthed in prayer, aren't they? Always. And then when I look at the life of the, of the, the prayer life of the majority of the church in Australia today, when did our eyes become dry? When did our hearts become cold? When did our prayers become dead? When did we, st when did we start relying on programs and strategies? And not that those things are unimportant, but when did we stop pressing into God and expecting him to do something unexpected? I could recount stories after stories where I was impressed by the power of prayer wherever the church is growing and being renewed. Story after story, it's almost hard to know where to start. Whether it was my three months in a Bible college in Hyderabad where the students would pray for hours every morning, whether it was in a prayer meeting in Korea, 
whether it was going to a prayer service in Indonesia where I discovered that many of the believers had travelled all night to be a part of a prayer meeting. Story after story where prayer was right at the heart of what God is doing. And that prayer is linked to a vital, connected, believing, confident community. We wonder why we don't know vital community and mission because prayer, community and mission are deeply connected. Uh, You'll discover I've got many hobby horses. I'll try not to give you all of them in one sitting. Um, Multiplying churches emphasize intentional church planting is another key thing. Um, It's hard to know where to start here, and I'll, I'll try not to labor it too much. But I think we need to birth fresh church planting movements that do so with careful consideration and planning, but with an ability to step out in trust and risk. I was interviewing a a pastor in um, Nairobi and I was saying to him, what kind, how do you know when a pastor is called to be a church planter? And he said to me, I don't really understand the question. Can you, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know how you've got pastors who do pastoral care and then you've got people who actually are called to church planting. How do you differentiate them? And he said, what kind of pastor doesn't plant churches? Now, I'm not suggesting that that's automatically transferable to Sydney or to Auckland, but what I realise, and this is what happens when you have global conversations, I realise that my whole way of seeing pastoral ministry and church planting had been very narrowly defined around my own context and experience. Now, I don't go to my students and say to them, you can't be a pastor if you're not planting churches, but what I say to them is that multiplication and is at the heart of the Great Commission that all living things reproduce themselves. And your role is to reproduce disciples, missional initiatives, church plants. We need to become church planting movements again. Um, This is on camera, so I'll be cautious what I say. Um, But I'm uh, connecting with large churches in Sydney that have grown very big but have never ever planted another church. And I'm saying to them two things often. Firstly, when are you going to plant? Okay. Secondly, why is your leadership so white? (laughs) You know, why doesn't your leadership look like your congregation? Anyway, that's another story. Um... And we might, come, we might revisit that in a, in a moment. Um, confident churches emphasise biblical power and authority. I'm a, I'm a big believer in the fact that we need to rediscover a sense of confidence in the power of the Word of God. Now, I don't think that's sort of a... There are dangers in this. And if we had more time, we could explore some of the dangers of a too literal reading of Scripture... But when you travel through parts of Asia and Africa, you discover the fresh confidence in the scripture and in the gospel that comes out of a ready identification, not only with the biblical world. You know, if you are a part of a culture that looks and smells and sounds like the world of the Bible, the world of witchcraft and poverty, uh, oppression and tax collection of prostitution and so on, if you're part of a world that smells and sounds and looks a lot like the biblical world, your ability to identify with that world is quite, um, is quite uh, maybe it's easier than for those of us that are further removed. But I think we need to discover again, as I suggested, a new and fresh confidence in the gospel and a hunger for the word. One of the things that has really become clear to me is I need to become, have a fresh confidence in the power of the Word of God. And that's shifted and changed my preaching dramatically. Effective churches emphasise local leadership. You know, forget about importing talent from outside. Forget about importing missionaries. What we discover is where the church is booming, there are often two things going on. Firstly, the scriptures are translated into the vernacular. So Laman Sanna, for instance, did a remarkable study that looked at the growth of the church in Africa where the scriptures were translated into the local languages. And he says the great thing about Christianity 
is that we don't have a sacred language. We have holy scriptures, God breathed scriptures, but we don't have a sacred language. Our scriptures are, are, you know, are translatable. So where the church is growing, often people are discovering the power of the word of God in their own, in the vernacular, in their own language. But the church is often booming, of course, with local leaders and local leadership. I think this is one of the key discoveries again for us. How do we develop and grow the, the leaders that are before us? So when I say to my, my pastors who are in my classes, I say to them, if you finish your training at Moreland College and you are the best preacher Australia has ever seen and that's all you do, then we've failed you and you're going to fail the church. Because your role is to multiply preachers. That's your role, to invest in a generation. If, you, if we develop you and you're one of the be best pastoral carers Australia has ever seen, and all you do is go to a big church setting somewhere and wow people with your gift in pastoral care, then you're failing that church. Your role is to multiply pastoral carers and a generation of pastoral carers. This is one of the key things we're trying to impress upon a generation of Baptist leaders, that your key role is to equip and build up, multiply and empower the next generation and to pass on the baton. One of the ways you do that is by modelling the gift used well, but that's not the only way you do it, of course. And I think this is a big lesson for us. Again, where the church is growing quickly in parts of Asia, Africa and elsewhere, local leadership needs to be developed, often rapidly, so that they can keep up. Inspiring churches emphasise the priesthood of all believers. Uh, when, If you were my congregation, uh, one of the lessons I learned, I think, is this. Where the church is growing really quickly as well, you can't rely on ordained and trained and accredited people. You just can't. Um, firstly, because you probably don't have the resources or access to the kind of theological education that you need. But secondly, you're just growing too fast. So where the church is growing rapidly, you have to empower the whole body. The, um, the priesthood of all believers has been a notion that has been stubbornly resisted in congregational life in Australia. Baptists like to talk about being congregationalists and about empowering the lady, but we love nothing more than watching our paid pastors do all of the work. We need to discover again, what does this doctrine mean for us? And the other thing that goes hand in hand with this is actually releasing women to fully use their gifts in the life of the church. Now, we could have a big conversation around the, um, about the oppression of women in majority world contexts, and that's a really live question, just as it's, just as it's a question in church life in Sydney today. Um, but one, the other thing that I notice is where the church is growing rapidly, women are often at the forefront of that. Women are often at the forefront of that. When though, women recede to the background of church life when the church becomes more established. Um, and we need to be conscious of that. Prophetic churches emphasise justice and human dignity. And uh, um, when I was, uh, I spent some time in Peru talking to church leaders who were ministering all over the majority world and asking them, how do you go about doing mission? And they talk about things like caring for creation engaging in politics, um, transforming neighbourhoods. You know, Emil Daniel tells this great story about half, after the Rwandan war, the war in Rwanda, one of the things that they had to do was go about rebuilding the ecological systems, caring for creation as a witness to a watching world because so many of the military units had, had this kind of raise the, you know, you know, raised earth type policy. One way of, of um, you don't just, you know, rape the population when you come through, but you also rape the land in order to oppress your enemies. 
and to deal with them harshly. And M.L. Daniel says, you can't do witness unless you care for creation. How can you go about being the people of the gospel without rebuilding communities, neighbourhoods and the earth in that context? Um, anyway. Uh, expanding churches often embrace a very simple model. Reproducing churches emphasise churches planting churches. Um, one of, that's one of the great lessons for us. And we're trying to work out about what does this mean for us in Sydney. Denominational bodies and agencies can facilitate and help. But church movements happen when churches plant churches, often resourced and encouraged from the outside. Um, healthy churches emphasise rapid reproduction. Impacting churches emphasise whole of life, faith and mission, which is what I've suggested. Forget the old dichotomies of proclamation and social justice. Caring for creation and so on. All of those dichotomies make no sense. And often when you're moving around the church in parts of Asia and Africa and Latin America and you begin to talk in language that sounds very polarised, very either or, very much about dichotomies, people don't understand what you're even talking about. What does it mean to embrace a gospel that unites things that should never have been pulled apart? The spiritual and the secular, proclamation with doing justice, politics and prayer, business and ecology. Wherever we emphasise community, mission, discipleship, justice, ecology, equality, we pull these things back together again. An integral, holistic, lived mission and life, uh, uh, church life. Then we address the needs of the whole community. Then we are truly people of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally, maturing churches emphasise contextual theology, faith and mission. We could talk a lot about that. But um, I guess the, the main thing I want to emphasise here is that sometimes I hear people say, but hold on a second, when you go to parts of Asia or parts of Africa or whatever, all they are doing is just repeating Western theology. And I think that that is true. But I often remind people, when I go to Bankstown in Sydney, or when I go to Hamilton outside of Auckland, how many communities are doing contextual theology today? Like before we get too critical of, of the church in you know, a, part, a part of Asia, how many churches are actually doing rigorous contextual theology today? What I'm discovering more and more is that where churches, churches are maturing, they're giving space for believers at grassroots level to explore what it means to be people of the gospel in their own particular context, in their own particular way, in light not only of their own tradition and of, of the scriptures, but in light of what God is doing globally. That's what contextualization is all about. And I try to help pastors learn the skills of helping local communities do contextual theology. What are some practices that emerge out of this? Let me race through some key practices. The first practice is this. We need to be a people who firstly reimagine the church. Reimagine the church as the new humanity. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. The new humanity in Jesus Christ. You know, Emmanuel Katongali tells a story of the Rwandan genocide. And he says, how is it that believers who once worshipped together hacked each other to death with machetes in the very same buildings that they once worshipped together in? And he says, the thing is, that the Rwandan church is just a mirror to the Kiwi church. It's just a mirror to the Australian church. Whenever the people of God lodge their identity in something other than being the new people, the new creation in Jesus Christ, one new humanity, whenever they see themselves as Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or or female, to use Paul's words, whenever they see themselves as Hutu or Tutsi, Palestinian or Messianic, uh, Kiwi or whatever, 
whenever that's our primary identity, it's not that God obliterates those identities, but whenever that's our first and primary identity, then we commit the same, prob- uh, same sins. We need to reimagine ourselves. The problem with the church in, in the West today, it's in fact a global problem, is that we have a deformed, dysfunctional, disfigured social imagination. Um, here I'm, I'm echoing or riffing off the words of others. We have a disformed and disfigured social imagination and we need to get back to the biblical imagination. The good news for us is that Paul identified the same problem in the early church. We need to reimagine what it means to be the church. We need to renew lament. And by that I mean that we don't know how to lament. We don't know how to lament our racism, our sexism, our nationalism, our colonialism, and what other ism you want to think of. What does it mean to lament and to lament well? The Psalms give us a vocabulary for lament. The various movements of the chapter of Lamentations give us a pattern or a vocabulary for lament today. There's a Korean American who's written a great book on uh, lament. And he says, part of the problem with the American church is the American church doesn't know how to lament. And when you discover vocabulary for lament, lament follows a certain kind of pattern. We describe the lamentable situation. We connect, we connect that, that lamentable situation with our pain and our suffering and our sorrow or the sorrow of those who've been marginalised in our society. We speak hope because God is the God of intervention and mercy. Then we see how our corporate sin is connected with our corporate dysfunction and pain and loss. And then finally we pray for God's mercy, God's healing, God's intervention, God's hope and God's restoration. And so we need to renew lament together. And I just happen to have a book coming out in August. Nice segue that looks at practical ways that small groups can do each of these 10 practices that I'm unpacking today, just for you to pay attention to, that little segue. Then we need to repent together, the third practice. We can repent of so many things. We can repent of white cultural captivity, racial gender injustice, and of our complicity in those things. We can can, uh, repent of our individualism, The fact that we have betrayed the gospel by making it a very individualistic, a very materialistic, a very syncretized gospel in the West. We need to repent of all of these things. And repentance runs a certain pattern, doesn't it? A pattern of four C's. Conviction about our sin. Contrition for the way in which we have betrayed the gospel or gone astray. The third C, a commitment to living a new way, the way of the people of God, the way of the Sermon of the Mount, the way of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the way of the gospel, conviction, contrition, commitment, and then concrete change is the fourth C. We repent together and practice becoming a new people in the world. The fourth There is 10 practices. The fourth practice is relinquishing power. Now, in one sense, we we own the power that we have. That can be used on behalf of others. But we also choose to relinquish power. And power is certainly used. um, The power that is associated with our, our ethnicity, our status, our privilege, and so on, for the sake of others. I put out a call for people like me who speak at panels to say, I'm not going to speak at that particular panel unless there is a woman and a person of colour, to use American language, who is speaking alongside me. I got a lot of hate uh, from my peers. I, I, I won't tell you the amount of hate I received from people who said to me, Graeme, it's okay for you because you're not famous. This is me paraphrasing them. It's okay for you because you don't make a living out of speaking on panels and at major American conferences. 
It's okay for you to say this because you're an unknown. But what about me? How would I feed my family if I refused to speak at, on panels, especially, or where there's multiple speakers at conferences, unless there is a woman or a person of colour? And I said to them, yeah, but what about all those who can't speak at those places because you're speaking at those places? What does it mean to relinquish, to give up? Uh, I think this might be number five. I should have numbered these. Um, uh, five is about restoring justice to those who've been denied justice. Brenda Salter McNeil has this wonderful book called Roadmap to Reconciliation. Um, and she says that we will never restore justice to those who've been denied justice unless we go through th uh, four steps. And she used the acronym CARE. The first step is to talk about the injustice, to talk about how certain groups have been marginalised and ignored and discriminated against. To see uh, in CARE stands for communicate what we've learnt about the specific issue and learn together, listening closely. What do women tell us? about what it feels to be a woman in the life of the church. What do Maori or Aboriginal leaders tell us? Communicate what we've learnt by listening and by giving space to those who are from people groups that are often not heard. The, the A in care is advocate for change. Talk is good, but get moving is better. Advocate. Um, three is relate to people of different contexts uh, and begin to address the issues. Um, relate to people, listen to their stories, connect with other theological traditions, other racial groups, other church traditions as well and begin to build connections and to grow as a consequence. Communicate, advocate, relate and then educate. Continue to educate yourself and uh, be a community of those who are becoming educated about the issues. Is, these are some of the steps in restoring justice. Relish diversity is the sixth discipline. I, I often get, get to speak at a church called Parkside Baptist Church. And Parkside Baptist Church is about close to a thousand people or so. But when you enter the building, you see all around the walls of the building there's about 34 flags around the walls of the building that represent all of the nations and people groups that are a part of the life of this church. They're in a part of Sydney, like many parts of Sydney, that are becoming rapidly multi-ethnic. And what they do is they relish diversity. You know, early on they decided we're not going to be able to relish the diversity of the people of God if we don't begin to change and mix up our leadership group. You can't celebrate diversity and have all male leaders. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to upset people when I say things like this. You can't relish diversity if you only have white, middle-class, middle-aged men leading your church. And so what they decided is they needed a leadership team that reflected not only the people groups in the life of the church, not only the language groups, but also what's happening in their broader community. And that's made a big difference for them as a church, I think, and we could talk a lot more about this. Moving away from ethnically segregated churches to fostering diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural ones, fostering cultural intelligence, Committing to welcoming and fostering and relishing diversity, racial, theological, physical. How many people who are, who come from a mentally or physically um, uh, difficulties are a part of the leadership and ministry of the life of your church? And reshaping the leadership team are uh, some ways we can do this. We're almost there. The seventh habit is to reinforce agency. Uh, too often we remove people's agency and voice. Agency is all about 
giving people the opportunity to exercise free, unfettered, independent voice and choices. How do we seek out the minority and the marginalised groups in our midst and give them a chance to have a genuine voice? How do we talk about our own prejudices and unconscious biases? How do we advocate for those who've been silenced? How do we listen to the global and the local church? How do we get involved in movements where that can happen? Uh, reconcile, uh, reconcile relationships is the eighth practice through repentance, forgiveness, justice. There's no reconciliation where justice is not done. Um, I spent some time interviewing some Christian leaders in the uh, Palestinian territories. And when you walk into, when I talk to these Palestinian leaders, I talk to Amal Nasser, you walk into the cave and all around where generations of Palestinian Christians going back to the Ottoman Empire have worshipped God. And you walk into the caves and all around the caves are painted words of, of peace and reconciliation. We refuse to be enemies. And they will tell you reconciliation isn't just about bringing people of all ethnicities together to listen, to cry, to lament and to seek justice. But it's also about peacemaking, about justice making. Reconciliation isn't some left wing, labour voting, progressive idea. It's right at the heart of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 to 21. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation, recon seeking that people might be reconciled to God, to each other, to the earth, for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Recovering life together in light of the Sermon on the Mount. When I first when I began reading the Sermon on the Mount, I thought, well, you know, Philip Yancey says, the Sermon on the Mount is about ultimate demands and ultimate grace. None of us can live the Sermon on the Mount without the grace and the empowerment and the enabling of Jesus Christ. But what I've realised is that this is Jesus' vision for a people I realise to my horror that I read the Sermon on the, Ma of the Mount in a very, you know, post-enlightenment, individualistic way. When I read it, I think to myself, how can I live like this? That's a very individualistic Western way of reading the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' vision of a blessed, distinct, righteous, just reconciling, virtuous, enemy-loving, wise, alternate people. It's a new way in the world lived together. And suddenly when you read it like that, you think, you read it differently, I think. And it's actually a much more radical ethical vision when it's a vision of a community, of a people in the world. Anyway. That's one more hobby horse I have. Um, revitalizing through practices, uh, practices of blessing people. My, my colleague, Michael Frost, who, um, whenever I speak at a gathering, people lament that Michael is not speaking. <laughs> Michael Frost has his great book out called Surprise the World, where he uses bells. B-E-L-L-S. And he says, Bell stands for bless. Seek to bless people in your neighbourhood. Start eating with people. Jesus was crucified because of the people he associated with. Not only because of this, but, but also because of the people that he ate with. Eat. When you eat with people, it's amazing what happens. Bless people around you. Eat with them. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is wanting to say and do and where is he wanting to move you. Seek to uh, what's, um, learn to be like Jesus and then lastly, be sent into the world. Begin to pray with your eyes open, your heart open and your hands open.
Two, two final things and then I'll, I'll finish up. The first thing is that we need to become a global local or a global church. Whenever I talk about being a global church, my, my wife rolls her eyes. She says, oh, Graham, please, you're just trying way too hard. <laughs> what does it mean to be a global local church? Recognising that the global is always in the local. The local is always in the global. And we are called to be a people who live that out in our humility and openness, our expansiveness and our conversations, our conversion to each other, where we, we bend and we twist and we break the divisions and the borders and the boundaries that have kept us apart, where we pay attention to each other as a new people of God. And then lastly, you can go to my website, you can buy my books and there's my last... <laughs> my American friends tell me that I should be far less apologetic for what I do, so let's just dwell on that for a moment. <laughs> My benediction and my prayer for you is that the God of creation would fill us with the confidence and the hope to be one new people who listen with openness to the Spirit, who pay attention to what God is doing in the world today, who are filled with courage and humility to be God's people, recognising that God is doing something thrilling in the world today and we are called to be a part of it. Now unto him is able to do far more abundantly than what we could ever imagine or ask, according to the power of him who works within us. To him be the glory in the church and to Jesus Christ through all generations. Amen. Amen. Amen.